Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Try something new today. Walk away from the hustle and bustle. Forget the life you thought you needed. Take a trip and walk the overland. A journey so enlightening, so invigorating, so arresting. Travel at your own pace. Meet wonderful people and explore new cultures. Experience vast jungles, beautiful beaches and sprawling cities. India, Thailand, Malaysia, to name just a few, are ready, ready to make your to dreams make your come true. Hello and welcome back to another I Could Murder a Podcast. This is episode number eight of series four. I'm Tom Norris and I'm joined once again. It's your boy, Benny C. Three quarters of the way through the series, Tom. Time flies when you're having fun. It does. It really, and it drags if you're not. Um, <laughs> so we're back in Boston Sound for another very interesting case. Uh, we hope everybody enjoyed last week's episode, The White House Farm Murders. Um, and it was one that kind of the debate still rages on. It does still rage on indeed. So, Ben, we're at a 75% mark of the series, three quarters of the way through, and we're going to let the lovely audience pick the 11th case of the series. Yep, he's absolutely right. So why not consider heading over to at Could Murder a Pod on Instagram, which is where we're going to hold the vote. Um, it was a, it got very heated last time, Tom, um, and we're excited to see that happen all over again. And if you're looking to support the podcast, why not head over to our Patreon page where we've got Round about 40-ish episodes, minisodes on there. And we've also got Q&A on there. It works out as roughly a pound a week for the content. And we let you guys vote for the content on there. Um, so there's plenty of episodes over there. Or head over to our store, um, icmop.store, where you can buy lovely merchandise. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> what? Or head over to our store, which is icmop.store, and you can get lovely knick and knackers. <laughs> Or you can head over to our store, which is icmap.store, and you can get little bits and bobs that we sell as merchandise. <laughs> no, no. Why not? That's all right. So this week's case is none other than Charles Sabraj, a.k.a. the Serpent, a.k.a. the Bikini Killer, a.k.a. the Splitting Killer, a.k.a. the Hippie Trail Killer. Yes, a man that goes by many names and many identities, which we'll go into. Um, he's very much a shapeshifter. Mm. And in this case, it's got a lot of elements to it. Uh, you might recognise it from the TV series The Serpent, which is on BBC and on Netflix now. And a little shout out to Vine Effects, a company which my wife works for. They did all the visual effects on the series. It's a great series, so give it a watch. There you go. Uh, as Tom said, it's not your typical case. There's, it's a very wild case. Wild is the word that comes to mind. Yeah, wild. Wild. <laughs> yeah. It's going to get all wild up in here today. Um, not your typical serial killer. And I find that the first half of his life, although we've kind of brushed shoulders about this a little bit, is more interesting than the serial killer side so of his life. So turn it off after we've done the beginning bit. Right, so we're going to look into his um, his history before he went on to commit these horrible crimes. But also, there's a bit different this week. There's a little bit of a timeline before the timeline because it's it shows kind of how he ended up in the situation he was, um, and the kind of more kind of petty crimes and other crimes he'd be committed beforehand. So it's a slightly different format this week, but we'll get right into it. So Hotchand Bawani Gurumuk Charles Sabraj was born on the 6th of April 1944 in what was formerly known as Saigon, uh, Vietnam. However, it's now regarded as Ho Chi Minh. He was born as a result of an affair between a wealthy Indian textile merchant who was his father and a Vietnamese peasant girl who was his mother. His parents were called Sabraj Hatchard Bavini and Tran Long Fun. Um, and they basically the parents weren't married, so he's an illegitimate child. And the relationship they have is very volatile. The parents would later go on to separate, which meant that Charles spent a lot of his time kind of toing and froing between different families. 
So his father would go on to abandon the family when Subraj was three, marrying an Indian woman in Poom. This was through an arranged marriage, and his mother would go on to marry a French lieutenant and move to Marseille in France and start a new family. So when she did this, she left Charles with um, with his dad, but his father neglected Charles, and apparently he was living on the streets, and he learned a lot of street smarts from that, petty crime and how to deal with people and kind of manipulate situations. Once his mother returned to visit, she was appalled by the situation he was living in, and then she decided to take him back to Marseille with her. Um, but he, Charles was very angry and hurt that his father didn't like fight for him to remain with him. Yeah, I think he very much idolised his father. And there's like unlike typical cases we cover, there's no kind of um, sexual or physical abuse in his childhood. But he did very much feel uh, a sense of abandonment from from both his mother and his father, which would go on to potentially play a part in what he would later do. So yeah, he's he's on the streets. He's he's travelling a lot between the two families, and um, yeah, he's getting a taste, as you said, for for kind of petty crime here. And as Ben said, his dad, he looked at his dad as kind of his hero when he was growing up, and apparently his dad was very charismatic as well. And he was very persuasive, which is something that Sabraj definitely kind of learned from him. And his father as well would travel a lot between different countries, living out of a suitcase, which Sabraj definitely follows that same pattern. So at the time, there was a lot of uh, conflict in Vietnam, um, which meant that uh, Sabraj's stepfather would take the family to France in 1953. While in Paris at a Catholic boarding school, um, Charles basically began to resent the European uh, lifestyle. Um, he became the butt of many racist jokes and started to resent the fact that he'd arrived in France. The only lasting impact of this was that he did decide to uh, change his name to or abbreviate his name to Charles um, after he would regularly impersonate that of comedian Charlie Chaplin. So when he was back home with his family and outside of the boarding schools, he would regularly throw tantrums and persistently wet the bed. Um, he also ran away twice from his family home. Yeah, so his mum would actually try and uh, deter him from wetting the bed by tying a string around his penis, which is not recommended in any books. Um, Chick Tilo vibe there. Yeah, he's got smacked on the Yeah. I'd probably prefer the string. I wouldn't want either. Uh, but I don't I don't piss the bed, so I can't. Same. When Charles did run away to Saigon in his teens, his father would send him back each time, but finally he did agree to kind of for a trial visit of him staying there. And one of the times when he sent him back, he basically said, okay, I, I agree, like you, you can come over here and he was going to send a ticket, but that ticket never came. And I think this is the kind of period where it really fractured the relationship between him and his father. And even at this early stage, when Charles was 10, he was showing a manipulative side of him and getting his younger uh, stepbrother to rob a shopkeeper, apparently bragging to his mother he could always find an idiot to do what he wanted. It's a bold statement for a 10 year old. It is, it is. And like, yeah, he is something which, yeah, as I said, he's very manipulative, but he could charm people into doing what he wanted. And this is something, yeah, we'll, we'll go into that he does this a lot in the future. Um, bold statement, but possibly a more bold two year old holding a store up. I think he held well, it up. Robbing a store, sorry. Bubblegum in the pocket, probably. I don't know, man. Whilst in Marseille, a very young Sabraj, although he would go on to become a very charismatic individual, um, at the time he would start selling Christmas cards on the street of Marseille. However, he would pull very bold and aggressive sales tactics in that when people didn't want to buy Christmas cards from him, he pulled a knife on them. That's not going to get a repeat custom. Sabraj started working in many different restaurants in uh, across Paris and Marseille, uh, essentially in roles as a busboy or kitchen assistant, peeling the veg and uh, washing the dishes. Um, so you could say he's the serpent. Who washed the dishes well. Yeah. You could say that. I wouldn't, but I just thought of it. So Charles would hold many different roles at many different restaurants. However, the most infamous one is at Le Coupel uh, restaurant, uh, which was basically very, very high society Paris. Um, he would see as kind of the uh, the door would open glimpses of, you know, the rich and famous that would dine there, very much wanting to be out of the back and into the main light. A bit like Ratatouille. So as I mentioned, we're going to do a mini timeline now. So maybe we can do some slightly different music or maybe just slow down timeline music for this one just yeah, to kind I'll of get on it don't worry yeah, thank you mate cheers dan i appreciate it and uh, so we're gonna go through this now which kind of it sets up charles to be the way he ends up being it's just a bit more context around him because he does have a very fascinating life and this is a little glimpse into that so here is the mini timeline so in 1963, uh, this was Sabraj's first jail sentence, and this was for burglary. Um, he was jailed at Poissy Prison uh, near Paris at just the age of 19. He would end up serving three years. 
well, as a busboy, probably didn't mind serving. So apparently it was very harsh conditions in there. He had to use self-defence and, and manipulation in there to survive. And that earned him special favours from prison officers, such as keeping books in his cell. You could say um, he's the serpent who keeps books in his cell. You could say that. In prison, he met a man called Fe- <laughs> In prison, he met a man called Felix, who was a wealthy socialite who came to Poissy each week to help prisoners with letters, resolve simple legal issues, and provide companionship. Charles quickly latched onto Felix, whom he treated as a savior and a role model, perhaps the father figure he never had. So Felix just sounds like a stand-up guy. So Felix came from a a very wealthy family who were all very much about doing their part and giving their bit back and they would support vulnerable people where they could. But I think Felix perhaps went that extra distance and uh, Charles probably viewed that as as someone he could, uh, you know, get his claws into and and potentially manipulate. After Sabraj was paroled, he moved in with his new friend Felix. So imagine that locked up and then you're out and you make, uh, you find yourself a wealthy roommate. I can only imagine, Ben. It's like Ratatouille, isn't it? It is a bit, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no, Dan. <laughs> so Sabraj and Felix become roommates. They share time uh, together between the high society of Paris and the criminal underworld and made money through a series of scams and burglaries. So again, he's probably, you know, uh, manipulated Felix slightly well, there. Well, the question is who corrupted who? Was, wow. was Felix on the prowl to find someone who had the nous to be able to do the crumbs that he wanted to do. Like, was he sniffing around there? Or did Charles, yeah, completely corrupt him. Bit of this, bit of that. Come see, come sir. <laughs> there was a woman in Sabraja's life, Chantelle Desnoyers, and they first met when they were both teenagers in Paris. They never married, but had two children, a son named Prank and a daughter called Muriel Anouk. So in 1969, Sabraj would break up with the mother of his two children. He went on to woo another Chantal, uh, this time Chantal Compagnon, um, a woman from a conservative Parisian family, um, so very well-to-do family. Um, he met her at a party and instantly she was taken with the well-travelled young man who told her of his fictitious wealthy family back in Saigon. So there you go again. He's very much a storyteller in the people that he meets. He's, he's definitely kind of... Uh, wanting to build relationships with people of high society and now he's ended up kind of seducing a a second Chantal in his life. One night Sabraj stole a car and took Chantal to a glamorous casino and he started to wager thousands of borrowed money and he blamed on Chantal which is very nice of him who had put off his request to marry him and later with Chantal terrified beside him he sped home at breakneck speed until Chantal agreed to be his bride. He was arrested for the stolen car and sent back to to Poissy for eight months and Chantal waited for him which why would you wait? Yeah, it, I guess it just goes to show the level of manipulation and how he was able to sucker people in. Yeah, so he's gone from blaming his uh, gambling failures on her to then speeding off and forcing her to marry him. So at the time, reports that were written by court psychologists stated that Sabraj exploited 100% of the weakness of those around him. They went on to say he has a small conscience, if any, and is capable of politeness, but calculatedly so. Impulsive and aggressive. So you start to see kind of the signs of the serpent here. Um, Anyone he can get under his spell, he will only do it if there's you know something he has to gain from them and in in this case he's he's shown that with you know uh, with friends he's made in the prison with friends he's made outside of the prison in high society felix he can, felix yeah absolutely felix um he can kind of adapt to lots of different societies a shapeshifter you, yeah so Braj and Chantel were married upon his release in 1969 and soon after facing mountain suspicions by French authorities, he and a now pregnant Chantel left France for Asia to escape arrest. They travelled there through Eastern Europe using fake documents and robbing people. So he's very much bringing her in to his world now. They kind of, she's now witness to this and she's actually benefiting from what he's doing. So she's getting kind of deeper and deeper into his world. Yeah, and it's how much he has her under his spell at the, at the moment. Like, like you said if he's if he's proposed to her in in that way you know what else is he imagine going? the honeymoon <laughs> so in 1970 the couple arrived in bombay where chantal gave birth to a baby girl usha usha not usha like you just said in the practice run i said ursha we can, we can prove you did no no <laughs> ben, play the clip am i pronouncing that usha, usha or usha yeah not usha usha, usha. Whilst there, Sabraj resumed his criminal lifestyle by running the car theft and smuggling operation, often gambling the profits away. So he wasn't very good at the old gambling. I mean, you could say he's the serpent that has some cars to sell. 
So Sobraj's new business uh, put him on the road for much of 1970 and 1971, leaving Chantal lonely and homesick in Bombay, often wondering where he had gone. To appease her, he brought her back jewellery, and some very lavish jewellery at that. Yeah, wasn't it Claire's accessories, Tat? Um, I'm sure she liked it. In 1973, there was a botched armed robbery at a jewellery store in Hotel Ashoka. After three days of drilling with little progress, well, sounds like they have in Ashoka, uh, it was clear the plan would fail. Sabraj obtained the keys to the store at gunpoint from the owner and proceeded to empty the cases, fleeing to Delhi Airport with a bag full of stolen gems. Sabraj was forced to abandon them at customs when the store owner notified the police, who sealed off the airport. Charles left $10,000 in cash and even more in jewels as he returned empty-handed to Bombay. So the interesting thing about that is I think he'd put a little crew together and they actually planned to drill in through the roof of the sh- of, of the shop but whatever i think it was some sort of marble they couldn't drill through it every time they tried the drill bits it just wouldn't work tom so instead of that he posed as a hotel guest um he called the store and asked the, the owner of the jewelry store to come to his room so he could potentially buy some product and then he went into the room and no product was bought um it's very much taken Shortly after returning, he was pulled over by police in a stolen vehicle, and based on eyewitness identification, he was arrested for the attempted robbery. He was taken to Bombay's prison, and from there he staged the first of his dramatic prison escapes. Charles was taken to a local hospital where he was diagnosed as having appendicitis, and some sources say apparently it was a bleeding ulcer, even though there was nothing wrong with him. Recovering from a needless surgery, Charles convinced Chantel to help him escape from the hospital by drugging his guard. Chantel crawled under the covers in Charles' hospital bed, presumably to trick the guards into thinking he was still there and took a dose of chloroform herself to stop suspicions that she had conspired to help her husband escape. So that's just showing the lengths that she wanted to go for him there. So we're going to see many, many dramatic and interesting uh, prison escapes from Sabraj, one of which was when he had basically convinced another uh, prisoner to go and get him a syringe and a glass. Uh, Sabraj went on to then withdraw a certain amount of blood from his own system to fill the glass, drank it down, and then basically started making it look like he was coughing up blood and having like some sort of um, emergency issue. Obviously then they've suspected maybe a bleeding ulcer and uh, in fact there was nothing wrong with him but he, he's a smart guy, he can think on his on his feet quite quickly. So Sabraj was re- recaptured shortly after and both Chantel, whose unconsciousness had failed to convince police of her innocence and Sabraj were taken into custody. Chantel was re- released shortly after on bail and eventually Charles was able to post bail with money borrowed from his father in Saigon and then fled India. So Sabraj and Chantel uh, flee India and they arrive in Kabul. The couple use this as an opportunity to begin to rob tourists following the Asian hippie trail. The Sabrajas lived comfortably in Kabul, but soon Sabraj became bored and he took his family to the airport. He had neglected, however, to pay the hotel for the two months of rent and was arrested by Afghan police at the airport. So although the Sabrajas were in a, a, a fairly good spot then for a change, um, again, uh, Charles has decided that's not where he wants to be and, and up sticks. So Sabraj escaped this prison in a similar manner as he did in India, pretending ill illness and drugging the hospital guard. He fled to Iran, leaving his family behind. Um, Chantel, although still loyal to him, wanted to leave the criminal past behind and return to France, vowing to never see him again. Sabraj spent the next two years on the run, using as many as 10 stolen passports and visiting several countries in East Europe and the Middle East. Uh, He was joined in Istanbul by his younger brother Andre, who quickly helped in his many crimes in Turkey and Greece. The the brothers would pull a couple of minor heists in Turkey, then go on to flee to Greece when things got too hot. Not the temperature. The crime. And they would go on to rob a few tourists in Athens before they were arrested following a minor jewel robbery. Sabraj banked on the hope that Greece and Turkey, uh, historic enemies, would never share information about the two brothers who preyed on tourists. So he was a serpent who wished they wouldn't tell. Both were eventually arrested in Athens after an identity switch plan went wrong, but Sabraj escaped. Um, Sabraj was a wanted man and he persuaded Andre that if Sabraj pretended to be him, whose crimes were minor in the eyes of the Greek justice, he could walk out of prison a few weeks later. And he said that when he was safely across the frontier, Andre could tell the Greeks that they had released the wrong man and then they would let him free. However, he was turned over to the Turkish police and Greek authorities and served an 18-year prison sentence. That's insane. I had to do a double take when, when I was reading about this. And So there's no one that he won't put to take the fall before him. His wife, his, his friends, his family. Um, and yeah, his, his younger brother, uh, the one he's supposed to look after, ends up you know doing an 18-year sentence. It's like if um, Sabraj was in front of a dodgy rope bridge. Yep, go on. Everyone else, he'd, he'd make them cross it before him. <laughs> yeah. Just simple. Just simple. 
<laughs> that was such a bad metaphor. Um, there's probably a better one just on the spot. And now we're going to go into the main timeline where things really do start to uh, evolve. So the early 1970s, Sabraj and his wife Chantal filed for divorce. Basically, as we described in the mini timeline, um, Sabraj had pretty much put Chantal at the kind of front line of all his crimes. She was heavily implicit, uh, heavily involved in, in his different different escapades, but also she helped to support him breaking him out of uh, prison at one stage as well. So she basically has decided she's had enough. She's going to stay and raise the children they filed for divorce. In July of 1975, Sabraj is back on the run. This this time financing his lifestyle through various means such as drug dealing, petty crimes and even through the financial support of his now ex-wife Chantal. He continues his run of tourist cons, impressing them with his expensive taste and then drugging and robbing them. It's around this time that he meets Marie-André Leclerc, a medical secretary from Quebec, during her travels to India. Whilst she initially returns home, she is persuaded to go back to Asia and meet Sabraj in Thailand. Leclerc quickly becomes infatuated with Sabraj, his most devoted follower, the two become lovers and, although she remains faithful, he continues his affairs with other women. So this is someone he's very much got under his spell from the beginning. Yeah, and she get involved with his various crimes and whatnot. Yeah, and again, it's just him manipulating his way around. It's also been suggested perhaps that he had control of her because he kept he kept a hostage, hiding the passport and forcing her into that lifestyle as well. So yeah, around about this time, Sabraj would also kind of start collecting different people to kind of form this cl uh, clan around him who would go on to kind of take part in these crimes and he'd refer to them kind of as the family and this included two former French policemen named Yannick and Jax who he met by helping them to recover their passports they actually stole on himself and another person part of this clan was Dominique who was another Frenchman who uh, Sabraj helped nurse him back to health from a dysentery illness but this is an illness actually was a result of uh, Sabraj actually poisoning him himself and he was also joined by a young Indian man named AJ Chowdhury who is a fellow criminal who became his right hand man so yeah, Sabraj has got lots of connections in the criminal underworld, but also lots of police connections as well. Uh, There's repeat patterns of him kind of um, initiating the criminal aspect, but then reaping the rewards at the other end. So we talked about his car, like he was tr importing European cars into India. He was basically then getting a mechanic to strip them. They were stolen cars, strip them. Then he would report the cars missing to local police who would come and get the vehicles. Noticing that everything had been stripped, they'd then sell them at auction and Sabraj would go in and, and basically buy the cars legally for a very, very small fee and then sell them on, reattach the bits that had been stripped um, for, a, I think it was 20000 per car, that it $20,000 per car that he would sell on. There was also allegations that he, um, whilst when he was kind of seducing Chantal and, and trying to win her family over as well, they'd go to lots of like high society estates for dinner. And whilst doing this, he would scope out the layouts of the house, draw maps. He would then sell on maps to people he'd been in prison with before, but he would also charge them a finder's fee. Like he's literally trying to kind of reclaim any kind of value or any kind of money for himself he's just yeah we keep seeing like repeated selfish behavior from this guy but it's very it's intelligent very, at the same yeah, time it's very very thought out in october 1975 a young woman named Teresa knowlton from seattle had been traveling the hippie trail on her way to Kathmandu to study tibetan buddhism at kopan monastery she was 21 when she met Sabraj and his family. Uh, having checked into the hotel Malaysia, she was last seen leaving to attend a party at Sabraj's apartment in Bangkok. There have been multiple theories on what happened next. Some say that she was at the apartment being served refreshments where she was drugged. Other accounts suggest that Sabraj, AJ and Teresa were out for drinks at a bar and this is where she was drugged. But what is known for certain is that she was stripped, put in a bikini, and Sabraj and Chowdhury drove her to Pattaya Beach, where Chowdhury took Teresa into the water and drowned her. There's no specific reason as to why Sabraj murdered her, although some have suggested that she had been suspected of being a drugs mule, while others say Sabraj attempted to recruit her into the clan, but she refused and he was left frustrated from that. She was found a few days after her death on October 18th, drowned and burned. Another young American woman, Jenny Bolivar, was found around this time also in a flower bikini, drowned in the Gulf of Thailand. Her death was initially ruled as an accident, however, a few months later, the autopsy and forensic evidence revealed the drowning to be a murder. This is quite an ex escalation then from someone that had basically been a, a jewel thief, a, a, a fraudster, a manipulator, to now... A murderer. Yeah, no, it's, it's a big escalation. Obviously, he's gone from doing that, but also kind of begs the question: Are these the first murders he actually committed? Yeah. Um, you know, there's lots with this kind of timeline of him going all over the place. It's very hard to know exactly the things he got up to. But yeah, obviously, he's, he's getting his family in inverted commas to kind of help him out with these with these horrific crimes. Another theory I heard apparently was he wasn't a big fan of the people going on this hippie trail because 
you know they were smoking marijuana and, and very very chilled lifestyle and they had the luxury to be able to do this and kind of the disposable income to do this and I think he was partly jealous of that kind of lifestyle and jealous of kind of where, where they come from like a happy background where he felt like he had to kind of struggle and strive to be where he is thing is he, he's able to use his charm and his charisma to get what he wants in in a much darker sense but if he'd use that for good it sounds like a, talking about a superpower it's just, just charisma if he'd use that for good maybe he could have worked his way up the restaurant trade and maybe opened his own place Sabraj's restaurant um, and then he would have had you know the income and you know managing his own schedule he could have um I don't think he had any want to be in the restaurant business, though. He, you know, I'm just saying if he if he used it for good. Yeah. It, well, maybe not even restaurants. Maybe auto trade. Basically, he he yeah he had a lot of intelligence, natural intelligence. When if he applied himself, he could have been successful and probably wherever he turned his hand to. But he went down this route. There you go. Yeah, because very Ted Bundy vibes from him in terms of his charm and his intelligence. It's just a psychopathic straight trait, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of people we talk about is, is their, their charm is part of what they, how they act and how they kind of so easily slip into people's lives, isn't it? And get them to do things they didn't, wouldn't normally do. Mm -hmm. So later in 1975, the family met a Turkish Sephardic Jew named Vitali Hakim. His last movements aren't well documented. However, many theories have arisen as to how he came to anger Sabraj. Some say that Sabraj tried to recruit him into the family and that he declined, whilst others have stated that he was a drug rival. Either way, Sabraj beat Hakim, snapped his neck and doused his body in gasoline. Hakim was then set alight. His burnt body was found a few days later on the road to the Pattaya resort where Sabraj and his family were staying. December 1975, Sabraj met Dutch students Henk Bitanja and his fiance Cornelia Hemke in Hong Kong, where they were invited by Sabraj to join him in Thailand. Henk, having just finished a master's in chemistry but yet to find a good job, had persuaded his fiance to see the world with him. Henk told his best friend, We'll probably regret this, but we're going to spend every dime we have. If we don't do it now, we never will. Um, Sabraj dazzled the Dutch couple with his expensive lifestyle, taking them from boutique jewellers to high end restaurants. Sabraj led the Dutch couple through the streets of Hong Kong, across the waters of Victoria Harbour on the world's best ferry ride, and into the duty free shopping district where he escorted Henk and Cornelia on a gem buying expedition. Sounds lovely. As a special favour to his new friends, Sabraj allowed Cornelia to buy a sapphire ring from his private collection that he claimed to have. She paid $1,600 for it. In a letter to her family in the Netherlands, she insisted that the price she paid for such a ring was about half of what she had encountered in Hong Kong's best shops. She went on to say, Our new friend's name is Alan Dupois, she wrote, and he has invited us to visit him in Bangkok. Once in Thailand, Sabraj invited the couple to his room, where movies played from his television and little bottles of scotch whiskey or imported beer could be fetched from a machine. Henk was so impressed by the wonders of the room and the man that he wrote a letter home to his family in Amsterdam telling them of his new friend. So the 12th of December 1975, the couple who had been staying with Sabraj, and unbeknownst to them, Sabraj had actually been poisoning them with the aim to nursing them back to health and being indebted to him, were taken away in the middle of the night half carried and half dragged by Sabraj and Chowdhury in Sabraj's car. Hakim's girlfriend, Shemaine Karou, had come to investigate his disappearance. Fearing exposure, Sabraj hastily disposed of the Dutch couple. Sabraj and Chowdhury strangled them both, also smashing Cornelia's skull with a board. The couple were doused in gasoline and burnt alive, their bodies reaching out to each other as they died. Sabraj and Chowdhury returned alone to the apartment where Dominique was called to clean the pair's muddy trousers. Dominique noticed the smell of gasoline but asked no questions and did as he was told. Hank and Cornelia's bodies were found four days later, closely followed by Charmaine Cruz, who had been drowned in circumstances similar to Jenny's, but she was wearing, apparently wearing a dress and not wearing a bikini, but the media connected the murders, as did the police, and they were dubbed the Bikini Murders. So December 21st to 22nd of 1975, Sabraj and Leclerc enter Nepal using Hank and Cornelia's passport. The couple soon meet Canadian Laurent Carrier and Californian Connie Bronzich. After an apparent argument over some gemstones that Connie had purchased in India, the couple are stabbed to death and burned, their bodies dumped in separate locations. Seeing an opportunity, Sabraj and Leclerc then return to Thailand, once again using their latest victims' passports before their bodies could be identified. The two victims were initially incorrectly identified in some sources as Ladi Dupar and Annabella Tremont. 
allowing Sabraj and Leclerc to easily travel back to Thailand and escape any authorities who may be looking for them in connection to their ever-growing list of victims. During this time, Sabraj's family had become suspicious of him, noticing that many of the people attending parties at Sabraj's are turning up dead and discovering blood-stained documents and possessions belonging to them in his apartment. Yannick and Jax notify local authorities of their suspicions and flee to Paris, along with Dominique. So think about these passports. Back in the day, the passports were very easy to kind of manipulate because if you will put some pictures up of them, it, it was, yeah, it wasn't hard for them to change the kind of details on there and manipulate them. Otherwise, it, it, it's, it was just very, very easy. Like, not compared to now, obviously, where it'd be near enough impossible. But, um, yeah, it's, they were literally just like bits of paper with a picture. You could just put them on the top of it and they'd be done. Early 1976, Sabraj is known to have travelled to India, where in Calcutta he murdered Israeli scholar Avoni Jacob in a rundown Calcutta hotel room by drugging and strangling him. Sabraj stole Jacob's passport and traveller's checks, about $300 worth in total, to get himself to Singapore, to meet up with Leclerc and Chowdhury, where they went back to India and, surprisingly, back to Bangkok, where the authorities were looking for the group in connection to the murders. March 1976, Sabraj Leclerc and Chowdhury are questioned in Bangkok by Thai policemen in connection with the murders of the Dutch couple and women in bikinis, but no further charges are pursued because authorities feared that the negative publicity accompanying a murder trial would harm the country's tourist trade. And we actually did a, a Patreon episode going way back of the British backpackers uh, in Thailand, and again, that was very, you know, still to, that was a much more modern case, but the immediate response was not, you know, preserving the crime scene or uh, making sure the rest of the island was safe. It was about the the reputation of the tourism yeah. to the to the island. So yeah, that's that's one that's remained through time. So during this time, Hermain Nippenberg, a Dutch embassy diplomat, and he's a very key figure in this in this case and in very much in the T V series The Serpent, he's one of the main characters. Catch me if you can vibes. What do you mean? Tom Hanks this guy would be. Well he's in the serpent and he's played by an actor. Vibes. Catch me if you can, vibes. So he was investigating the murder of the two Dutch backpackers, which we discussed, the ones that were burnt alive, and suspected Sabraj, even though he did not know his real name. Uh, Nickenberg started to build a case against him. He was given permission by the police to conduct his own search of Sabraj's apartment whilst he was out of the country. Nickenberg found plenty of evidence, such as victims' documents and poison lace medicines, which he kept to build a case against Sabraj. So late 1976, the trio travelled to Malaysia with the purpose of accumulating gemstones. It is here that Chowdhury acquires some gems through various criminal means and gives them to Sabraj. After this business meeting, Chowdhury disappears. It is widely assumed that Sabraj murdered Chowdhury. Perhaps over a business deal gone wrong, his body is never found and remains unfound to this date. There are some suggestions that Chowdhury, having assumed other identities before, successfully left his old life and authorities behind, including an unconfirmed sighting in Germany in late 1976 that would suggest that this may have been the case. However, when Sabraj met Leclerc at the airport to catch their flight to Geneva, Chowdhury was not with him. Leclerc inquired as to his whereabouts, but the look in Charles's eyes told her never to ask that question again. So a pretty specific look. To this day, authorities believe that Chowdhury, the partner in crime of so many of Charles's murders, had outlived his usefulness to Sabraj and lies buried somewhere in the steaming Malaysian jungle. I guess if he, you know, because he would be someone that could implicate Sabraj, so he's just thinking, if I get rid of him now, that it's not going to bite me later on. So soon back in Asia, Sabraj started rebuilding his clan, start, starting in Bombay with two women named Barbara Cheryl Smith and Mary Ellen Ether. Sabraj was needing cash and continued drugging and robbing tourists. Unfortunately, Frenchman Jean-Luc Solomon, who Sabraj drugged to incapacitate him during a robbery at his hotel room in New Delhi, never regained consciousness, and this was an intentional death that added to Sabraj's clan's ever-growing list of victims. So July of 1976, continuing their crimes streak in New Delhi, Sapraj and the free women tricked a tour group of postgraduate French students into hiring them as guides. It almost seems like he's making this up as he goes, just seizing on any kind of little opportunity. Sapraj tried an old trick, drugging the group by providing them with what he claimed to be anti-dysentery medicine. The drugs started acting too quickly with some students dropping unconscious in the lobby whilst Sabraj had gone to rob their rooms. When someone realised that the only people who were ill were those who took their new friend's medicine, a trio of students quickly wrestled Sabraj to the ground and sent for the police. The police arrested Sabraj and quickly rounded up the rest of the crew, including the new recruits Barbara and Mary Ellen, who quickly cracked and confessed every 
everything. Sabraj was charged with the murder of Solomon and all four were sent to Tihar prison outside New Delhi while awaiting formal trial. In Tihar prison, all four members of the family were classed as murderers and kept imprisoned awaiting trial. For the women, this was a shock to the system as their food consisted of bread and water with whatever else they could buy. The water came out of a standpipe in their cells once a day and if they weren't ready for it, they would have to wait until the next day's rations. The prison was overrun with rodents and insects. Their toilet was a hole in the floor of the cell. Leclerc's cellmate was a young Malaysian girl who had been arrested and then forgotten about and she was slowly going insane. For Charles, however, his conditions were not a surprise. He knew how things worked in India and concealed in his body were more than 70 carats of precious gems. While his new home wasn't as comfortable as his apartment in Bangkok, it would do until he decided it was time to move on. So again, he's a... He's got a plan for everything, this guy. Yeah, so he's storing 70 carats of precious gems inside his body to kind of haggle whilst he's in there. So he's thinking ahead. Prison pocket. Oof. So between 1976 and 1977, the trial of Sabraj was filled with surprises and showmanship. Sabraj was firstly represented by criminal lawyer V.K. Ori, who had seen him through previous court cases. However, Sabraj hired and fired multiple lawyers. Finally, he enlisted the help of his half-brother, Andre, who was granted early release from his imprisonment in Turkey. Well, that's the relief. Wanted to help him back. Brotherly love, innit? One-sided brotherly love, if you ask me. Throughout his trial, Sabraj went on hunger strikes to protest the inhumane conditions within Taha jail. There was a mid-trial appeal to the Indian Supreme Court and a witness, Mary Ellen, recanting her statement of seeing Charles drug Jean-Luc Solomon. During the trial, the judge was unimpressed with the theatrics and found Charles guilty of administrating drugs with the intent to rob, causing her to commit robbery and the Indian equivalent to manslaughter. Culpable homicide not amounting to murder. Sabraj was convicted and sentenced to seven years imprisonment. Surprisingly, he was spared India's death penalty, even though the prosecution fought for it and some sources believe Sabraj bribed court officials to avoid it. He was sentenced to a further five years on other criminal charges, making a total of 12 years imprisonment. Marie was found not guilty but was returned to Taiha to await trial and poisoning of the French graduate students. She would eventually serve some time for that crime and be released on mercy parole when diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She died at home in Canada. Apparently as well she died, like after all that she'd been through and very quickly meeting Sabraj, she still died like completely in love with Sabraj. Yeah, she took back the statement um, to try and spare him. And that could have potentially, you know, kept him off the death penalty as well. So, so Andre has basically done time for Sabraj and he's still willing to go out and represent him as a lawyer. I don't know how much experience he has being a lawyer as well, but um, it just goes on to show exactly what kind of hold he's managed to have on people. Despite the severe conditions in Tahar, Sabraj managed to lead a leisurely prison life bribing, threatening and blackmailing officials to get whatever he wanted. He enjoyed good wine, gourmet food, had access to a television, a typewriter, a fridge, a large library and even drugs, with fellow inmates apparently calling him Sir Sabraj. Sabraj kept prison officials in fear of him by threatening to file a petition against them in the Delhi High Court. It is alleged that he could even be found on occasion having tea with the prison superintendent. Well, the serpent probably was quite happy having rodents knocking about. Um, um. <laughs> Am I right, Dan? Huh? Yes. Thank you. Jesus. And again, that links back to uh, Ratatouille, because rodents and look, that is weak. 16th of March 1986, just before his sentence was due to end, Sabraj threw a party for the guards. It was a Sunday and there was a skeleton staff, so he drugged them with sleeping pills and attempted an escape. So with this guy's reputation, yep. he's got everything he could possibly want in his cell, but also they probably know of his criminal background. I guess they don't know that he's got the drugs there. So from the skeleton staff, nobody suspected him. Yeah. You could say that. Yeah, I guess Arthur was a pretty a bone to pick with him. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, maybe they just thought they were just ribbing him. Too hard. Yeah. Um, but so, so Raj was that foot. Um, yeah. And uh, he probably didn't have a shoulder to cry on. Yeah. In prison, so he left. <laughs> <laughs> so he left. Oh. Oh. But yeah, no, they probably didn't know that he had those particular drugs in there to, dr to drug them. Even then, with his background, I'd just be, if he offered me a drink, I'd probably say, Charles, I'm waiting outside. You're going to his party. Be yeah. really rude not to have the drink. Well, I'll say hello and then say, you I've know. I've got to pop off because we're skeleton staff. There's not many of us here. Exactly. I've got a whole prison to go after. Yeah. Just have one drink, Ben, you ungrateful piece of, have one. 
I don't I want one, Charles. Oh, well, go on then. I'll have one drink yeah, with you, Charles. Go. All right. Glug up, you idiot. <laughs> Got you. Got me what? Present. No, you're asleep now. It lasts the whole rest of the podcast, weirdly. Oh, thank God. So Bra just somehow managed to uh, drug uh, the skeleton staff. Uh, he was successful, if only for a short while. He was arrested in Goa in April following a manhunt by police nationwide. It is likely that Sabraj was caught on purpose. He knew that there was still a warrant out for his arrest in Thailand where he could face the possibility of the death penalty. His plan was to avoid this by being locked up in India for another decade. The exact sentence for a jailbreak. So he's already fought this through. He is very thorough. And he doesn't seem to make mistakes by accident. There always seems to be a reason for him. During his second stint in Taha jail, Sabraj was selling his interviews to the media for as much as £2,500 and spoke openly of the murders, whilst never actually admitting to them. He maintained that his actions were purely in protest against Western imperialism in Asia. So he's trying to turn it to be like fighter of justice. I found it so interesting that he could actually get that money as well for selling interviews when the prison wouldn't prevent that. He would often say things to certain journalists and he'd say that they weren't true afterwards and it was just pulling the strings. The 17th of February 1997, Sabraj was released from Tahir on parole. The 20 year extradition warrant from Thailand had now expired, so he knew exactly what he was doing there, meaning that Sabraj would no longer be sent back to face the death penalty. When he was released with no country to extradite him to, the Indian authorities allowed him to return to Paris as he had always claimed French nationality, having been born in Vietnam when it was under French rule. He was kept in custody at a police station whilst his travel was being organised, fearing he would escape again. So on the 8th of April 1997, Sabraj flew from India to France. The press crowded into Charles de Gaulle Airport awaiting his arrival. Sabraj settled in the suburbs of Paris to enjoy his retirement. Loving the attention and behaving like a celebrity, he hired an agent and began charging thousands for personal interviews and photographs. A bizarre twist of fate there. He speaks with a very uh, D David Ginola French. accent. French accent, very <laughs> French accent, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So in 2003, perhaps bored with the suburban lifestyle or the fact that his celebrity had faded, Sabraj returned to Nepal, where there was still a warrant for his arrest for the murders of Laurent Carrier and Connie Bronzic in 1975. A sighting of him in the streets of Kathmandu on September 17th by a journalist turned out to be his downfall, and Sabraj was arrested on 19th of September 2003 at the Royal Casino in Kathmandu's five-star Yak and Yeti Hotel. Yak and Yeti. Sounds lovely. Gambling again and being his downfall. Yeah, and also any time he seems to get a sense of stability or, you know, keep himself out of trouble, he he gets bored very quickly and he wants... hit self-destruct. Yeah, yeah. So according to the Himalayan Times, Sabraj's official reason for returning Kathmandu was set up to start a mineral water business. Good place to do it. It seems to be a very... He's got no past experience with that whatsoever, but... The only yeah. minerals he's been dealing with are jewels. 2004, Sabraj was found guilty of the 1975 murders of Laurent Carrier and Connie Bronzic and sentenced to life imprisonment. At his trial, the prosecution relied on evidence accumulated by the Dutch diplomat Nippenberg. So Nippenberg had the last laugh there. So Nippenberg was very kind of forceful with doing this. I don't think his seniors were very like supportive of him taking this mission on, mm -hmm. but he very much kind of went out of his way to try and chase him down. And yeah, it seems like he got... You know, the final laugh there. So there you have it, the serpent is finally behind bars and it was Nippenberg and apparently his wife was heavily involved as well in kind of um, archiving various documentation and news uh, news reports on Sabraj. He also actually, as well as claiming to have been there to start his own mineral water company, he also claimed there to be making a TV documentary. He was very open about talking about these murders, well, taking back and saying he did the murders and not doing the murders and all about the crimes. So he liked the claim and that suggested perhaps his uh, celebrity was fading, so stepping back into the uh, spotlight. So three years after being sentenced to life, Sabraj basically uh, had launched an appeal through his lawyer to to then French President Nicolas Sarkozy for an intervention with Nepal. So, as we mentioned before, he was, you know, very, he looked up to his father, then it got very fractured. Um, it's actually a letter he wrote to his father, which is detailed in the book about Sabraj. It says, It is really unfortunate that you are my father. Why so? Because a father has a duty to help his son build a future. You pray to God at the temple, but your conscience is heavy. You bore a son, but you ignore him. You, you abandon him worse than a dog, worse than the lowest beast. From you, I will carry only the name you gave me. You are no more my father. I disown you. I will make you regret that you missed your father's duty. The fortune I will get without you, and I will use it to crush you. 
So obviously he was very motivated to kind of outdo his father in all that kind of way. And his mother would actually go on to say, Charles has the face of an angel, but somewhere I think the devil crept into his soul. Wow. So yeah, very poignant there. But it's, yeah, it shows like he just kind of distanced himself from the family and just went on his own crusade yeah i mean it seems kind of similar to last week's case in that that sense of belonging or that sense of abandonment sabraj obviously noted that his father remarried and had many many children there with his uh, second wife and uh, he felt felt a sense of rejection there but he never suffered any kind of physical abuse sexual abuse it just seemed to be that emotional neglect in some ways i don't know the penis string that's some form of abuse yes yeah. but um, yeah it is, it's not as clean cut <laughs> And as obvious as, as at previous cases, he was happy to be like living with his father, but on the streets, kind of learning his, his own way of life, dealing with people, knowing how to get by, how to manipulate people. He seemed to bring this forward throughout his whole life. The reason why he was so able to um, shapeshift and kind of be different people and assume different identities was it was very hard for people to pin down his actual nationality. He allegedly could speak seven languages, which yeah. just shows how clever he is. And also, yeah, so he hit the different passports from different places. It's quite easy for him to actually become that identity. Quite a interesting quote, I thought, when when he was asked about escaping prisons, like how is, how are you so you know good at it? How you been able to do it? He said, "The desire of the guards to keep me imprisoned is no match for my will to be free." Prove that a few times. Yeah, so he he very much seems to be like Ben said before, a master of his own demise in terms of. He would get a bit bored or want to, like, everything was kind of like settling down in certain parts of his life, but he wanted to then reroute everyone and go somewhere else and kind of continue this lifestyle. But yeah, he, he left a, lot, a complete like path of chaos behind him. Yeah, and he had a chance for a fresh start multiple times and particularly when he, he was finally in France before going to Nepal, he had like a completely clean slate. Yeah. And yet he decides to go back to exactly what would be his downfall. So in 2008, Sabraj announced his engagement to a Nepalese woman, Nihita Biswas, who would actually later participate in the reality show Big Boss. I imagine that's like The Apprentice. Yeah, makes sense. Through her, he would issue various press releases, though one that's most notable is that he was claiming through this press release that he was never actually convicted of murder by any court, and he asked the media not to refer to him as a serial killer. So again, still very image conscious, hated the idea that people would view him as a monster or a killer, um, and was really adamant that that not be uh, kind of spread. There's a famous interview of him talking just quite openly about his crimes. He recounts that later on. He is you know, subject to four biographies, three documentaries, an Indian film titled Manush Charles, and a 2021 eight-part BBC Netflix drama series we discussed. He hired a publicity agent and charged large, sum, large sums of money for his interviews and photographs, apparently he's allegedly charging over $15 million for the rights to a movie based on his life. Jeez. So yeah, he seems to be very much enjoy, enjoying the... Um, the attention he gets and i'm sure he gets a little kick kick from it when oh people. definitely so yeah i don't know the exact uh, legalities in terms of m making that money and charging for those interviews and stuff like that because i was fairly sure that wasn't possible but, yeah. but as i said perhaps it's, it's different law there so to this day uh Sabraj remains in a nepalese jail he's had a few health issues over the years in uh 2018 Sabraj was in critical condition and had been operated on multiple times he had actually received several open heart surgeries and as of uh, this current uh, the day of filming uh, he remains in jail aged 77 and in fairly declining health so it's time for our look-alike. Is Ben? Would you like to start? <clears throat> yeah. So I'm I'm going to pop my picture up now because this picture has been <sighs> messing with me for the last couple of weeks. It's a picture where I can see someone, and there's 100% someone there. So please comment section, Ben. This is who you think it is because my look-alike is. I'm just going on the hat and glasses. So I'm going for like a 10% junior soprano uh, from the Sopranos. It's mainly the hat and the glasses, but this photo, that I, I'm fixated on it. I've sent it to family, they couldn't help. I've sent it to friends, they couldn't help. I'm asking for the audience's help. Producer Dan now just looking at the picture. He's got a little grin on his head. Please tell me you've got it, because it's really face. bothering me. Any, it, <laughs> Have you got it? Uh, no. I've gone for a different picture, um, and I've gone for, he looks like, a Vikram from The Office, um, Ranjit Chowdhury. Um, Very good. But the combination with the hat there... Probably that face though, that hat on that face mm. is who I went for. I always seem to say this in lots of different pictures, looks obviously over time, aging and whatnot, he looks very different. And I'm sure there's a lot of good looking like it's out there. So do let us know because they are always a lot better than ours. Well, one report called him a social class chameleon. So maybe he can adjust to different settings, have lots of different looks. Yeah, similar to the um, shape shifting thing. Similar, yeah. Yeah, similar. 
<laughs> oh, God. What are we going to do with you? Who knows? Shift you into a fuck. Anyway. And that is the case of Charles Sabraj, the serpent. Very different case to our usual. So much going on. Such a very extensive timeline before and, well, the mini timeline as well. Um, he seems to just have an un... He seems to not be able to quench the thirst he had for the money and that kind of lifestyle. And yeah. That would ultimately be his downfall. It would indeed. There you go. So thank you as always for, for watching or for listening. We really, really appreciate it. If you are listening and you're part of the audio crew, please do feel free to leave us a like or a review. We would really, really appreciate that or a rating. Um, and if you are audio, why not check out our YouTube channel? Because every episode that you're listening to has got a video version uh, up on our YouTube page. And people tend to say, you guys don't look anything like we imagined. Yeah, which we don't know what that means. Never know really. how to take it. We don't like. Someone once said we don't look we don't sound like we should have beards I've or facial hair. I don't know what that means either. I don't know. And someone was surprised that Danny was Dan, producer Dan was a 60 year old man, which I don't know how to take that for him. I mean, I know how to take it poorly. I had a weep of that. Yeah. That's all right, mate. And if you want to support the podcast in another way, we do have a Patreon, like we mentioned, which over 40 episodes now, uh, detailing lots of different minisodes, lots of different cases. Ben, do you want to list a few off? Some big ones recently as well. So we've had the, the Munich Massacre, the Manchester Canal Pusher, the Jonestown Massacre, a lot of massacres. Uh, well, actually, they're probably the only two massacres we've done of the 40, but I'm rambling. And the Bjork Stalker. So lots of interesting episodes, whole host to go through, and we're uploading new episodes every single week. And they're available in audio as well as visual, so you can pop in your headphones and just do your homework, do your washing up, um, and walk around the garden. And as always, we have socials, so at Could Murder a Pod on Twitter and Instagram. We're actually going to be doing a vote for one of the episodes in this series on our Instagram page, so if you haven't yet, please consider following us over there, and thank you for helping us get over the 5,000 follower mark. We really, really appreciate it. And if you've been watching this going, oh, we like these mugs, well, you mm. can't get them because they're not on the store, but we do have mugs, a different style, readily available. And we do have hats, and we have stickers, and we're, we're going to be bringing some new things to the store, so keep an eye out for that. There you go. And that is at icmap.store. And guys, like we always say... We say this all the time. Keep doing <laughs> what you're doing. Unless, uh, guard in the gates of hell. The serpent. Serpent. The bikinis. Mm. And the mineral water. Mm. Jewels up the... Skeleton staff. Nobody suspected it. Cheers, guys. See you later.